Janet has a question about Hebrews 12, 1. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Mm -hmm. is witness here in the sense of someone testifying in court or in the sense of a spectator of an event or both? Are those saints of old watching us? Can people in heaven see us? Are they watching me take a shower, Mike? (laughs) Well, I hope not. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I would say the answer to all those questions is a qualified yes. Okay. Now, I I don't think they're all equally in view, but all of them are in view in some way. I'll, I'll try to quickly explain what I mean by that. So we have no reason to suspect that residents of the spiritual world can't see what happens here. For example, angels show John in the book of Revelation all sorts of things happening on earth in the book. Okay, the angel isn't wearing a blindfold. And he's not guessing. He, he sees things that are going to happen or are happening. He sees the events as well as John. That's one thought. Angelic mediation. It's an Old Testament concept. I get into it a little bit in Unseen Realm. I'm going to get into it more in, in uh, a book I'm, that'll be out in the summer or the fall on, on angels. But angelic mediation requires that angels know what's going on in our lives. Now, I, I, that's, that's about angels, Mike. We're talking about you know departed Christians. Well, that's good. Good. So am I, because glorified believers are like Jesus, will be made like him, 1 John 3. And so it stands to reason that their ability, an angel's ability to see what's happening on earth, isn't going to be greater than those of us who are made like Christ. I think we're going to be at least be equal and uh, honestly better because Christ is superior to angels, all right? So if we are made like him, in glorification, then I think we have every reason to think that, yeah, you know, we we could see what's going on on earth. Now, on the other hand, I think we also have good reason to suspect that we'll be more interested in what's going on in God's world than on this one. (laughs) In other words, I would rather be, you know, spending time, you know, with the Lord or with some, somebody like, you know, some, some believer I'd always wanted to meet or something like that, or a loved one you know, on the other side than watching Trey take a shower. I really would. Yeah, I think what's going on in the heavenlies is going to be a lot more interesting than what's going on here. So that's why, again, I have this qualified yes kind of thing. I think the primary focus here in the passage, this, this great cloud of witnesses thing, is to part of what the, the question touched on, and that is this idea of a witness uh, specifically. You know, we're surrounded by believers who have finished the course and who have inherited what was promised. They are witnesses you know, to the fact that they have an eternal address in the household of the council of God. They testify, they witness, they bear witness to God's promise being fulfilled. Now, th- this idea is related to the ancient Near Eastern treaty idea, where, again, in, in pagan a- a- ancient Near Eastern religions, they had the gods. You know, gods were penciled in in treaties. And they were listed in treaties as witnesses to a covenant being made. So there, there's some relationship to that. In the biblical instance, this kind of language uh, occurs in several places. I think, personally, the most interesting one is Psalm 89. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw attention to uh, an article by E. Theodore Mullen. Now, that, for those of you who are really into the Divine Council, you're going to recognize that name right away. It was Mullen's Harvard Semitic Monographs uh, book, I think, published in the 80s. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it was like early '80s uh, on the Divine Council uh, that really, you know, sort of started, you know, interest in, in Divine Council study. You know, outside things like a dissertator. I mean, it was it was a, a really important book. And uh, again, I, I reference it in Unseen Realm a few times and in other places. But he also wrote an article called "The Divine Witness and the Davidic Royal Grant," in Psalm 89, verses 37 through 38. Now those, by the way, those verse references are in Hebrew. In, in English, it's going to be verses 36 and 37. That was from the Journal of Biblical Literature in 1983. And I'm going to post that article in the folder for newsletter subscribers, but I want to quote a few things from it just so that you know what we're talking about here and how it applies to Psalm 89 and I think ultimately to Hebrews 12. So on page 208 and 209, Mullen writes this, Within the context of the recent scholarly emphasis placed upon the use of treaty forms in the ancient Near East, the relationship between the Mosaic Covenant and the Davidic royal grant, the Davidic Covenant, has received great attention. 
While the Sinai Covenant is most commonly associated with the Hittite suzerainty type treaty, the best parallel to the covenant with David is found in the royal grants, which depict the unconditional promise of the king to the vassal as a reward for faithful service to the suzerain, to, to the king. Then he, he writes, our focus in this article will be Psalm 89. 37 through 38. Again, the English verses are 36 and 37. And here's what it says in English now, verses 36 and 37. It says, his offspring, again, the Psalm 89 is largely about the Davidic covenant. His offspring shall endure forever, his throne as long as the sun before me. Like the moon, it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. Okay, those are the two verses. Now, Back to Mullen, he says, this passage presents a motif not found in the Oracle of Nathan, 2 Samuel 7. That is the concept of a divine witness to the Davidic royal grant, the witness in the heavens, the Eid Bashakach, witness in the clouds, witness in the skies, of verse 38, is the guarantor of the grant. And as such, places the poetic promise to David in Psalm 89 solidly, both within the mythico-religious concepts associated with the covenant motifs in the ancient Near East in this period, and also within the legal requirements associated with royal grants. Now, I'm going to rabbit trail from Mullen for a moment here. Do any of you recognize the in the clouds phrase, shakach? Again, if you've read Unseen Realm, if you've heard me lecture, you should know where that comes from. The, the, the other time that phrase is used is also in Psalm 89, a little earlier, in the divine counsel scene. Divine, uh, you know, Psalm 89, verses 6 and 7. For who in the skies, Bashachach, can be compared to the Lord? Who among the B'nai Elim is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones? So, you know, we're going to come back to that because the same phrase occurs two different places in Psalm 89. One is clearly divine counsel. Then you have this other witness in the clouds thing going on. So back to Mullen on page 214, he writes this. The parallelism of verse 38 would tend to equate the witness in 38b with the moon in 38a. This is the identification made by Delcor, who notes that the image of the moon as a faithful witness evokes the juridical imagery of treaties in the ancient Near East, where the sun and the moon are named as witnesses. These two heavenly bodies, along with heaven and earth, represent natural opposites of creation, which preserve the covenant with Israel or David. These opposite pairs, or olden gods in ancient Near East, are often cited as witnesses in the reeve, that is the lawsuit genre in the prophetic works. And he gives a few references. And they have, a, it ha, they have a twofold function. Not only do they ensure the efficacy of curses or conditions, but they also guarantee the stability of the covenant itself. Hence, if this witness in the heavens of verse 38 is to be identified with the moon, the very nature of the universe guarantees the stability of the covenant grant. The promise that the throne of the offspring would be before Yahweh like the sun, in other words, eternally further connects this concept with that of the treaty witness in the ancient Near East. But, Mullen says on 2.15, 2.16, he says, yet this identification of the witness in the heavens is not wholly accepted, and he doesn't accept it either. This is why he, he transitions here. He writes this, in attempting to identify the witness, we should note that verse 38 does not specify a definite figure. The phrase denotes a witness, not the witness. In the same manner, it should be recognized that this witness in verse 38 is compared to, but not identified with, the moon. Just as the throne in verse 37 is compared to, but not identified with, the sun. Both words employ the preposition ke in Hebrew, which means like or as. This places the witness in the heavens on a level comparable to that of the sun and the moon in status and function. Perhaps a further clue to the position of the witness is contained in Psalm 89, 6 through 9. This is the divine council scene, so here he goes. The depiction of Yahweh in his heavenly court. It is most interesting that the phrase bashakach occurs twice in this psalm, once in verse 7 in the form of a question, and once in verse 38 in the form of a promise. Both occurrences presuppose some figure who stands before Yahweh in his court. If verses 6 through 9 and 37 to 38 are seen as integral parts of the psalm as a whole and its imagery, 
we would assert that both introduced the concept of the covenant into the legal realm of Yahweh's assembly, of Yahweh's council. That's the end of the quote. Now, Mullen goes on and he, he starts giving parallel data from Ugarit, you know, where El is the lead deity, Baal is the co-regent, the vizier, okay? Now, if you, again, if you've read Unseen Realm, if you've you know, read any of my journal articles, this is going to become important. Baal at Ugarit is the witness to decrees of El. Now, I use this in my dissertation, along with my discussion of the witness in the clouds, uh, as, as indicating, look, Baal is the council co-regent. I use that to argue that the witness here in Psalm 89 is the second Yahweh in Israelite thought. Because in Israelite religion, the, the, the head of the council wasn't El and then Baal as his, his vizier, his co-regent, his co-ruler. In the Israelite version, it was the, visible, the invisible Yahweh and the visible Yahweh. They occupied the two slots. Yahweh occupies both slots. So you have the second Yahweh as the witness. Well, who's the second Yahweh? That would be Jesus. So what you have here is you have Jesus, okay, the second person of the Trinity, the Son. Okay, you have the Son being a witness to God's covenant with David. In other words, you have the eternal messianic Son bearing witness to and therefore validating the covenant of his own earthly kingship. And it fits in really well with Hebrews 6, verses 13 through 19. And we can't cover everything in, in these episodes, so here we go with this. Let me read Hebrews 6, 13 through 19. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. Verse 15. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired, desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that endures into the inner place behind the curtain. Now, for our purposes, again, back to the plural witnesses, look at what you have here. You have God validating the Messianic covenant, the Davidic covenant. The Messiah is the son of David. It's, it's completely tied to, the, to Psalm 89, the Davidic covenant. You have God validating his promise to David by means of a witness himself, just the second Yahweh figure. And that second Yahweh figure is the same one that became incarnate as the Messiah. So you have, you have God and Jesus promising, certifying, fulfilling, and validating everything between themselves, and they can't lie. God can appeal to no higher authority. Now, that gets real interesting because in Hebrews 12, we have plural, we have the plural witnesses. This is back to the question. For our purposes, going back to the plurality there, we should read the plurality of Hebrews 12, the great cloud of witness, again, the witnesses in the clouds, great cloud of witnesses. We should read that against the backdrop of Hebrews 2. What's Hebrews 2? That's where Jesus presents us, presents believers to God, and presents God to us in the congregation, in the council. This is Hebrews 10, or Hebrews 2, 10 through 12. We read that scene. It's, it's us, in effect. It's believers you know, who are in glory, in the council, being presented to God and God presented to them. And Jesus says, look, these are my siblings. He is the guarantor of the covenant. So we are the witnesses in the clouds, or we will be, bearing witness to what, original, you know, what the original witness in the clouds accomplished through his own obedience after which he sat down at the right hand of the Father. I mean, the, the imagery is pretty dramatic you know, when, you, when you really get down to it. And so the, the cloud of witnesses idea, it, it does have you know, real hooks back into divine counsel thinking. And if you take it back to Psalm 89, God can promise by no higher authority than himself. And it's the Son who is the witness to that covenant. He fulfills that covenant, the Messianic covenant. And then by virtue of his becoming incarnate to fulfill that covenant, we become his siblings. And in glorification, we are part 
of the witness testimony. So again, it, it's a really, it's a theologically, you know, saturated passage, just that one phrase, and it has deep uh, ancient Near Eastern roots. Mike, are you sure that they don't want to watch me take a shower? You you don't know. You can't say that Elohim aren't watching me take a shower. You have no yeah, I, I, idea. I'm gonna go out I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that that's correct. You have no idea, sir. You have no idea what you're talking about, because hey. hey you know, <laughs> like I said, I will go out on that limb. 